On April 12th, 2016, 16-year-old Michaela Bali vanished from the face of the earth. Her friends last saw her at Sacred Heart High School in Yorktown, Saskatchewan, where she said she would be going on a vacation to Regina. While this may seem to be a straightforward case on the surface, the circumstances surrounding her disappearance continue to baffle investigators to this day. On Twitter, the Michaela Bali family still posts regularly, hoping that their daughter will one day appear. Despite the many tips and a full police investigation, nobody knows what happened to Michaela Bali. Michaela was a pretty normal girl. She was a big fan of the Hunger Games and fantasy video games like League of Legends. Her hobbies also included playing the violin and photography. Michaela was raised by single parents. According to her mother, she was quiet, sweet, shy, and a voracious reader, although not very adventurous or outgoing. Despite being a quiet girl, she was popular in her community. Her friends described her as a good listener. Bali's friends say she didn't smoke although she frequented the smoke pit doors, a rear entrance of the school where the smokers often hung out. She wasn't into drugs either, although there was an occasion where she showed her friends some pills and claimed that they were opioid oxycodone. Police investigations later discovered that the pills were actually Accutane, a medication Bali had been using to treat acne. We don't have any evidence to suggest that drugs were a factor in this, police said. At the time of her disappearance, Michaela was single. Earlier that year, she had dated an old boyfriend, and they remained friends after the breakup. Her friend Shelby claims that she also connected with a few people online, at least four, but that the communications were usually short-lived. However, on the day of her disappearance, it's widely suspected that she was in contact with someone. The only issue is that she used anonymous apps to communicate with people online, meaning that the police could not trace any of the calls she made or the texts she sent on that fateful day. As a consequence, they have to rely on the people she contacted to provide the details. The time leading up to April 12th, the day of Michaela's disappearance, includes some interesting events to point out. A few months prior, in February, Michaela received a bouquet of roses at school. She never told anyone who sent them. One of her friends, Hannah, claims that it was odd that the flowers came in a plain cardboard box. Apparently, the flower delivery had been from an online order. Unfortunately, despite identifying the sender, police never revealed that information to the public. Bali frequently talked about moving to a bigger city, and mentioned specific places like Saskatoon and Regina. The day prior, on April 11th, she talked about leaving town to go on a vacation. Her friends didn't take her seriously at the time. Later that day, according to her teacher, she seemed upset during class. After class, she texted her friend Oxkana, asking if she could take her to the bank the next day, and that it was important. Bali later called customer service at TD Bank three times, checked her balance, and transfer $25. In the evening, she contacted an ex-boyfriend, Shelby, and another friend named Amy. Amy later told police that Bali mentioned a man named Christopher, who would be coming to Saskatchewan to meet her. We now know that they never met in Saskatchewan. However, police did end up eventually investigating Christopher. The investigations by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or the RCMP, regarding Michaela Bali's disappearance have been quite thorough. The RCMP recovered footage of Michaela's movements the day she disappeared, where they last saw her at the STC bus depot in Yorktown at 1.45pm. They have interviewed anyone close to Michaela, and even investigated her bank activity, phone records, and social media, but to no avail. One of the greatest setbacks in this investigation is the method Michaela used to communicate with people online. Much of the time, it was through social media like Snapchat or Instagram. For police to obtain records of social media interactions, they must go through tedious legal processes that take many months. However, Bali also used an app called Kick, 
which has some dark history. Police claim that the app has been used by kidnappers to groom young women, due to the nature of the app where people can talk to each other without any filters or approval systems like friend requests. Before we go into any further details, it'd be a good idea to look at a timeline of events during that day. Fortunately, the Missing Children's Society of Canada and CBC News have provided a thorough overview of Bali's day before her disappearance. According to CBC News, Bali's movements were described as erratic. She walked to various stores around town, appeared to be looking for someone, and tried to get money, all while claiming that it was for a vacation to Regina. So, let's go over what happened. Here is a bullet list of the timeline of Bali's movements from that day. This information was taken directly from the Missing Children's Society of Canada website. At 6.41 a.m., Bali texted her friend Oxana again, asking if she could take Bali to the bank. Apparently, she had been claiming that she had $5,000. Police said bank statements showed that Bali had nowhere near that amount. Oxana responded that the bank wouldn't be open until 8 in the morning, and didn't take her. Michaela's grandmother said she dropped Michaela off at school at around 8.20 a.m. Police verified Wi-Fi records that showed Bali's phone connected to the school network at around 8.08 a.m. By 8.26, she had left the school through a back entrance. Shortly thereafter, Michaela's movements were captured by a surveillance camera at the Super C convenience store, where she was seen walking along the railroad tracks. Around 8.51 a.m., Michaela arrived at the local TD bank. Camera footage shows her talking on the phone as she waits for the doors to open. At 8.55 a.m., when a worker opens the shutters, she ends the call and approaches the teller to withdraw $55. It's important to note with TELUS data from cell phone towers, police are able to see the sending and receiving party of calls and messages, but the phone company does not retain the actual message. What's weird is that the phone call Michaela made in front of the bank didn't register at all. In fact, none of the calls she made that day were registered. Police had to wait 10 months to access her social media accounts through the proper legal channels, but we're not sure if they ever got a hold of her messages on the Kick app. After the bank, Michaela headed east towards Terry's Pawn and Bargain, arriving at 9 a.m. Police spoke to the owner, Terry Hedden, who claimed she tried to pawn a silver ring. Apparently, the value of the ring was too low. Hedden said that she didn't seem bothered, and that she simply left the store and headed south. About 15 minutes later, surveillance footage captured Michaela at a combined Tim Hortons and Wendy's. It was at this location where some strange things happened. She bought a drink and sat in a booth with her backpack next to her. During the investigation, one of Michaela's friends had told police that Michaela usually carried a purse to school, not a backpack. This is a clear indication that she left her home that day with the intent to leave Yorkton. In the footage, Michaela can be seen turning every now and then, looking at the entrance. At 9.23 a.m., Michaela leaves the restaurant through one of its two exits. then returns to leave through the other exit. She enters the Tim Hortons slash Wendy's at 9.49 a.m. while talking on her cell phone, another call that police weren't able to trace in their investigation. This time around, she sat at a booth facing the door. After ending her call, she waited sent messages, browsed her phone, and intermittently checked through the window. At 10.12 a.m., she texted her friend Shelby, Hey, I need help. Over the next 30 minutes, Michaela is on and off her phone, during which time she texted Shelby again saying, Never mind, I figured it out. In the same time frame, she left the restaurant again. 
only to immediately return and sit in the same booth. At 10.39 a.m., footage shows her looking around during a call. Four minutes later, she gets off the phone and approaches an older lady sitting at a nearby table. The police later discovered that Michaela had asked the lady for help with renting a hotel room. In fact, one of the key pieces to solving this mystery is understanding why Michaela was asking the lady for help. Unfortunately, the lady claimed she didn't know the reason. Whether Michaela needed the money for the room, or just an adult to make the transaction, the lady refused. She didn't know where Michaela wanted to rent the room either. After asking the lady for help, Michaela returns to her booth, makes another call, and leaves the restaurant while talking on the phone. There is a gap of time where Michaela's whereabouts are unknown. About an hour later, Michaela sent Shelby a text. I'll see you at lunch. At 11.59 a.m., Michaela had returned to Sacred Heart High School, where she met with two students, Ali Clarkson and Joanna Buckle. She told them that she was going to take a bus for a vacation to Regina. Police investigation reveals that she may have been carrying two phones at the time. Less than five minutes after meeting the two students, Michaela leaves the school. Michaela went to a bus depot after leaving Sacred Heart High School, where an employee remembered seeing her around noon. The employee said Michaela wanted to know what time the bus was leaving. She was told 5 p.m. and then decided to not buy a ticket. She was then spotted at a nearby restaurant called Trail Shop, where she purchased a meal. Unfortunately, there are not many cameras in this area, and her movements beyond this point are unknown. Nearly four hours later, at 3.40 p.m., Michaela's grandmother was waiting to pick her up from school. 20 minutes later, Michaela misses her violin rehearsal. Roughly another four hours later, Michaela is officially reported missing. By 7 a.m., her cell phone was off. Police have received many tips across the years. One of the tips was the Friday right after her disappearance at the local bus station. Many were hopeful that it would be Michaela, but it turned out to be somebody else. A few weeks later, Michaela's records were transferred to the General Investigation Section, or the GIS. This means that the investigation would be treated as a major offense. The officers of the GIS spent weeks watching camera footage, analyzing phone records, and going through the legal processes required to retrieve Michaela's social media data. To this day, there has been no activity on her social media, except for one occasion. A few months after her disappearance, a message she had been sent on Snapchat became opened, as if she had seen the message. On Reddit, a user claims that Snapchat causes messages to be opened if the person's account becomes deactivated. After 30 days, they become liable to be deleted. Once they are, they appear, as in the marker on the conversation shows, to have been opened, even if the recipient never in fact opens it. But just because 30 days have passed, doesn't mean the Snapchats will be deleted. It's kind of random. However, this doesn't seem plausible, since many of her social media accounts still existed at the time, like Instagram. And apparently Snapchat doesn't delete inactive accounts. Her Instagram account included selfies and pictures of her school friends and siblings. However, according to CBC News, there was another Instagram account under her name, with hundreds of followers but no photos. And the About Me section simply said, Goodbye. If these accounts still exist, I couldn't find them. 
Less than two months before her disappearance, Michaela made a post on social media with a screenshot of her Snapchat profile saying, Looking for Snapchat friends because I have none in real life. Add me. Please don't be a greasy fuck and send me gross ass nudes. Just looking for friend. Could it be possible that somebody contacted her that day and made plans to meet her the following month? In April. GIS officers investigated everyone in Michaela's social circle, including everyone she was known to be contacting on social media. Note that not all of her social media activity was recoverable, because some websites don't hold user data for long periods of time, and the legal processes to require the records can take months. One of the people that GIS did investigate was Christopher, who we mentioned earlier. Liang, Michaela's friend, had mentioned that Christopher was going to visit Saskatchewan, but Liang wasn't the only person to mention him. Michaela's ex-boyfriend also told police that Christopher was visiting the province to see his mother in Saskatoon. Police searched Christopher's house. In their investigation, they found no evidence that Christopher was in Canada during the time Michaela went missing. CBC News also reached out, to which he had this to say. All I can provide for you is that she suffered with self-harm a few years back. Back then, I was helping those who struggled, and I encouraged her to fight against self-harm and to look towards God. Police said there was no evidence to suggest that Michaela was suicidal at the time she went missing. However, the self-harm story was indeed corroborated by Michaela Bailey's description in the Interpol database, as found by one Reddit user. It says that Michaela has a fair amount of scars on her upper thigh from self-harm, side unknown. Michaela's friends pointed out to police another boy she had been contacting via social media, who goes by the name of Josh. However, they didn't know his last name. Police followed up, interviewing multiple people with the name Josh throughout their investigation, until they found a boy in Churchbridge who said that he knew her. The boys said they saw each other about once a week at a youth gathering. However, they hadn't spoken for a few years, and police said there was no indication that this Josh was involved in Michaela's disappearance. There was yet another man investigated by the police, a man who claimed to be Michaela's father. Michaela had told her friends that she didn't know who her father was, but that she wanted to meet him. The man who was interviewed by police, Rick Breit, said he was never contacted by Michaela, and he didn't think she knew his name. Michaela's mother, Paula, claims there is no evidence that Rick is Michaela's father. Despite the uncertainty, police searched Breed's house and even took DNA samples. They concluded that there was no evidence to suggest that Bree had anything to do with Michaela's disappearance. Bree even started posting online about Michaela's disappearance on his own behalf. At the bus depot, police interviewed an employee named Cheryl McDougall, who said Bali looked pretty normal for the kids who went there. About a week after the interview, McDougall contacted police with more information from a customer who remembered seeing Bali. Apparently, she was seen with a big guy carrying white bags. After putting out a sketch of a man described as having a tattoo of a cross with red flames on his left arm, someone came forward. However, the investigation concluded that he was simply holding the door for Bali, and that they were not together. After looking at all of the information regarding Michaela's case, police do not believe that she ever purchased a ticket, or got onto a bus leaving Yorkton. It's been several years now. Michaela's family runs pages all over social media with the hopes of finding her. Police have investigated over 600 tips throughout the years, including sightings as far as Scotland and Colombia. Among the other tips that the RCMP have received, a few stand out. In January of 2017, Michaela was believed to have been seen at an event at the Great Eagle Entertainment Center in Calgary. Considering the location has a casino, generally these places have excellent surveillance. However, police were unable to confirm if she was really there that day. The latest tip was in August of 2019 from a man in Edmonton who thought he met Michaela outside the Hyrule Club in Capilano. 
The man said that she was very sweet, kind, gentle, and naive. Sadly, the police could not confirm the validity of this tip. Looking at the locations of the sightings, if any of these are true, it would seem as if Michaela headed west after leaving Yorkton. In fact, the sightings are near locations that Michaela had discussed visiting, like Regina and Saskatoon. All of these locations are west of Yorkton, where she disappeared, including Calgary and Edmonton, the places that were reported to the authorities. Even with all of this information, it's still difficult coming up with a comprehensive scenario that could explain Michaela's disappearance. One thing does seem certain. Michaela wanted to leave that day. She had her backpack set up, she withdrew what money she had, and she hit the road. Whether or not she actually left or remains in Yorkton is uncertain. Whether or not she met with someone remains uncertain. It is precisely what happened to Michaela Bali after she left the bus depot that remains a mystery.